Was building on the lecture Versus coming daily under pressure Working on the plot and the scheme The true stock trademark is at the edge of your dreams I'm talking one One shot for the kill The breeze cut, freeze up Straight drop in the chills I'm talking Taking over pieces and shares of all big sky high Check the movement is here Yeah Yeah It's one heart, one shot Now the future is yours Go Turning dreams into reality In the lab with the formula in chemistry Your memories spark and motivate And make the industry shake We put the bars in the brakes I'm talking one So let's check audio real quick. We're going to talk about the Bravia 7, the Bravia 8, and the Bravia 9, and of course, their updated soundbar system, which I think is pretty awesome. So let's say a big hello to everyone as uh, we do an audio check real quick. Uh, hey, everyone's here. Getty, KG, John, Dreamer, Liz, Michael, Hammer Joe, AJ, Leo. Hey, hey, everybody. And if I missed your questions, keep on asking. Money Cujo, Nigel, all over the world is watching. And maybe since I'm starting early, you know, Sean from India might be able to catch this. It's a little bit last minute. I didn't expect to do a live stream today, but now I thought, oh my gosh, I have to fly to um, Valley Electronics at the end of the week, right? So I barely have enough time to talk Sony. And if I don't talk Sony now, when am I gonna talk Sony, right? So that's why I decided, hey, you know what? Let's, uh, let's talk about what Sony is expected to bring this year and what we know. And there is definitely a game-changing feature. So if you saw the <laughs> thumbnail and the title, by the end of Sony's presentation, I walked up to the Sony executives, right? The I think their regional director slash VP or president was there. And I said, you guys understand that you're completely undermining Dolby Vision, right? Everything you've just showed me is you saying Dolby Vision sucks. We could do better. And they kind of looked at each other. I go, don't you see what you guys are doing? And so we're going to get into what they actually did that all TV makers should do shortly. And I thought it's pretty brilliant what they did. So I, I guess audio is good, right? There's no complaints. So let's get into the various TVs uh, that we saw. Now, the X90L still comes into 2024 as a carryover of 2023. It's still called the X90L. It is their entry-level Bravia TV in that it does not have mini LED, but its performance is actually pretty good. And if you guys saw last year's review, I was very impressed. I thought it kept up with the U8K and the QM8. The black levels aren't as deep, but when it's in full screen, it was there. It's in the black bars that you saw the differences and the contrast may be a touch behind because less dimming zones, but overall it was good enough to carry over. And so obviously you guys know that is their affordable TV. What's interesting is we'll talk about the Bravia 7 right now. So the Bravia 7 has what, eight times as many dimming zones? And I'm thinking, wait, does that mean it has more dimming zones than last year's X? 95L, which we didn't get the 65 or the 75 inch, right? We got the 85 inch. But if you look at the specs, I was like, wait, the Bravia 7 is like 
the Bravia X95L or X95K from the prior years. And so that's their entry mini LED now. And then you step up to the Bravia 8. And then, of course, everyone loves the Bravia 9 mini LED. And you guys saw the footage of how in, in the countdown, right? You guys saw the footage of the Bravia 9. Those mini LEDs, that's what we're talking about. Is It's not so much the mini LEDs and the dimming zones turn on and off. They turn on and off with this gradient of brightness between off and fully on. And that's what separates them. So the other TV that you guys saw is the Samsung QN90C. The biggest differences between the Q90C or the 90D or the 95D or the 95C is that they have more dimming zones, but the subtle control of the dimming zones do not match what the Bravia 9 is doing. And this is unique to the Bravia 9. That level of control is not available on prior TVs. So the Bravia 7, for example, is old school brute force, right? It doesn't have that fine control, the precision dimming of the Bravia 9, just so you guys know. But I expect the Bravia 7, okay, so let's call an ace an ace or a spade a spade. <laughs> I'm mixing my metaphors. When I saw the 7 next to the 9, it was very obvious the 7 could not keep up. And this is so hard for me to recommend the 7 when the 9 exists because I would say, you know what, just get the Bravia 8, which is an OLED. So I'm just jumping over the place. So the Bravia 7 is their mini LED entry level with less dimming zones, although eight times more than the X90L. The Bravia 8 is a W OLED. It is technically a carryover of the A80L in terms of the core technology. W OLED, LG's W OLED, it doesn't have MLA. However, the Bravia 8 has a feature that is unique to the 8 that's not on the A80L. That could be a game changer for those of you who watch Amazon Prime, and we'll go into it. And this feature is shared by the 7, 8, and 9. So we'll start with that, right? And this is called Sony's, Sony called it their Amazon Prime calibrated mode. And this is why I think it's a game changer. So we know Dolby Vision, what it does, right? So Dolby Vision is a, dynamic metadata where scene by scene it tells all TVs this is the brightness in this scene and then the TV takes that information and so here's the problem the TV itself then is responsible for processing that Dolby Vision just because it has information does not mean the TV can do the processing well and so the TV has the Dolby Vision chip so you have the Dolby Vision source content you know graded in Dolby Vision it has all that metadata and the TV then takes that metadata and then it has to do it right. And as we've seen, the only TV that actually consistently does it right is the LG OLEDs, right? The C9, C10, C1, C2, C3. And it makes sense because LG OLEDs have consistently been the Dolby Vision select client monitors for Hollywood. So it better get it right. But everyone else, including Sony, has not been consistently able to do that. So Sony's like, ah, this, this is a nightmare. What they've done instead is they've worked with Amazon Prime, and this is why I think it's a game changer. So Amazon Prime does something similar. They then grade it, but what they have done is they match the grade to each of these Sony TVs. So Sony 7, Bravia 7, 8, and 9. They look at the calibrated mode on Amazon. They match it to that specific TV. They send it back to Amazon. Amazon double checks, and so, when you are watching Amazon Prime on the 7, 8, or 9, Amazon, let's say the Bravia 7, the Bravia 7 and the Amazon, Amazon will send a specific trimmed version of Amazon Prime to the Bravia 7. It's designed specifically for the Bravia 7. So the 7 doesn't have to do anything more than what it already did. It already sent what it can do to Amazon. They've got their back and forth already done. So everything that comes out of Amazon Prime, live sports, the actual videos, content, movies, rented movies. So it's not just Amazon originals. And this is why I told them it's a game changer, is that it's one thing if it's just the originals. Oh yeah, sure, if I enjoy watching The Boys or shows unique to Amazon, no. I was very clear when I asked the engineers at both Amazon and Sony, I go, wait a minute, what if I'm just renting movies like Oppenheimer or any of the popular movies, Barbie, right? And I want to get it specific to my TV, seven, eight, or nine. Can I get it on a rental movie? Yeah, yeah. everything on Amazon Prime 
If it sees that you have a Bravia 7, 8, or 9, it will send you a specific content designed for that TV. This is unheard of. This has never been done before. And so when I said, LG, G4, you have cinematic movement, you have that new processor, right? The AI director. What will Sony do to beat that? And this is it. They have worked closely with one platform. Now, this is not Netflix, so I'm hoping they do it with Netflix as well. Netflix has its own calibrated mode, but it's very similar to Dolby Vision, right? Hit or miss, like they send out their quote unquote calibrated mode and it's up to the various TV makers to match that mode to your TV. They shifted the burden on the TV makers. Here, the burden is on both Amazon and Sony, model specific. Bravia 7 has its own version of that feed from Prime. Bravia 8 has an OLED version for its W OLED and Bravia 9. And so if you're asking, wait, what about the A95L? Not mentioned. So I think there is some kind of processing in these three TVs that unfortunately does not appear to be on the A95L. I'm going to double check with that, but it doesn't seem that you can even add it with a firmware update. So I have the A95L as soon as I find out more, but I don't think so. I really think this is unique to these this new generation of 789. Now, this is all on paper. It's all in theory. We will definitely check that once we get any of these TVs, 7, 8, and 9. I will compare movies that are rented on Amazon Prime against my Kaleidoscape version, right? Standard HDR10. Does it do anything different? Because we've always complained. Dolby Vision, at best, it looks slightly different, not better. So out of the box, right? So the goal is to avoid calibration because homeowners, they don't want to calibrate. They don't want to hire a calibrator. They just want it to work. This is Amazon's and Sony's attempt at saying, look, don't touch any setting. The minute it gets a prime video feed, it will automatically set all your settings between the TV and the source. And of course, motion being what it is, I say you set your own motion, but everything else, color, white point, it knows your TV's tendencies. It will make the offsets necessary in theory. I love it though, because at least it's model specific. I have never seen a stream from a source broadcaster, Sam, uh, <laughs> I was gonna say Sam, Sam, Netflix, Prime, Max, it doesn't matter. They have one generic HDR10 feed or Dolby Vision feed. All TVs get the same feed. But in this case, if you have a seven, eight or nine, you get your own version of that feed designed for your TV. That's brilliant. But on paper, it sounds great. That's why I'm so excited. And Dolby Vision needs to respond to this because Dolby Vision relies way too much on the TV makers. Hisense, way too bright. TCL, sometimes the contrast and the color slightly off. Sony, way too dark, way too bright, all over the place, right? LG, closest to ideal, but then at the end of the day, wouldn't it be better if Dolby Vision created a trim for every TV model? Because you know what? You took our money. Let's spend it on this. So we'll see about that. All right. So I had to kind of share that whole thing that got me so excited about Sony's 2024 model lineup, specific to 7, 8, and 9, which is that feature. Okay. Let's see what question you guys have about Sony's, um, I guess, calibrated prime, Amazon prime calibrated mode. Okay, so Lisa, and I, if I missed your questions, I apologize. I'll try to catch it. And all right, so Lisa asks, what about watching Disney Plus, Apple Plus on these two new TVs? Will it be regular DV? Yes, it'll be business as usual. And the problem with Apple Plus and Disney Plus is if they're applying just Adobe Vision, Adobe Vision Switch, where you are literally just turning on a switch for Adobe Vision, but the content is not natively graded in Dolby Vision, it may not even look that good or it may not look, you're hoping it is. it looks the same and, and not worse. At best, it should look the same as HDR10 if it's not natively graded in Dolby Vision. So one thing you have to be careful with, whether it's Disney Plus or Apple Plus, if you're watching on a movie and it's not available in Dolby Vision on a disc, it is very unlikely that the studio regraded to stream in Dolby Vision and not put it on the disc. So the disc version, theoretically, is supposed to have been natively graded in Dolby Vision, and not all Dolby Vision grades are created the same, but at least on disc, there was an attempt to do something. But on streaming, 
It's as easy as flipping on a filter that's more static than dynamic just to get the Adobe Vision label because Adobe Vision has a static version, right? Everyone assumes, oh, all Adobe Vision is dynamic metadata. Not so. It may be quote unquote in a dynamic container, but the actual information may end up being just static. You really don't know. And this is why Adobe Vision is kind of all over the place on the TVs because the TVs themselves are all over the place. So good question, Lisa. Okay, and let's see here. Oh yeah, hey everyone in chat, don't forget to click like, and I know I'm gonna be bumping up against Sony's own live stream with my friends there. So yeah, I met them at the event. It was fun talking to them. They're like, oh wow, you live stream, we're going to be inspired to live stream just like you. So I would love to see, watch their live stream after this is done. I'm gonna to try to steal their thunder and see if I do a better job, right? So let's watch their live stream after mine and see who does a better job of covering their TVs, me or them? So let's go through the different TVs real quick again. So we cover the Bravia 7, right? It's their entry level mini LED with eight times more dimming zones. But as we know, it's what you do with the dimming zones. But honestly, next to each other, the 7 definitely looks slightly more washed out than the 9. I would say for the price, and I don't know what the price for the 7 is yet, because you know how that changes, get an OLED TV. Now it's slightly brighter, but the G4 is going to destroy the seven i already know it ahead of time because that thing is so bright i'm watching the g4 and i was like wow in sports mode this thing is just brighter than my mini led i have the qm8 <laughs> i have the the x90l and the g4 is brighter than the g3 and i mean if we're talking brightness the seven is not going to get you there however if you're talking color accuracy skin tones that i think it's it's uh, the calibrated mode may make a difference. Now, let's talk about the Bravia 8 OLED. So it really is an ADL carryover with that additional feature being the Amazon Prime mode. So I talked a lot with, with my friends there and Brian, and we were like, you know what? Why would anyone get the Bravia 8 when the A80L is literally going to perform nearly the same? Well, you would if you are a heavy watcher of Amazon Prime. That is the only reason. And then we're assuming that there, there is that big jump in accuracy, right? So we'll compare and see if that does make a difference. But if it does, then yeah, that would be the reason to get the 8 over the A80L is you're a big Amazon Prime watcher. But if not, you know, you're watching Kaleidoscape or Disc or Netflix, it probably doesn't matter. I think the A80L ends up being an even better deal because we know generation to generation OLED generally looks very similar until they get MLA. So the differences between the C9, C10, C1, C2, C3, and C4, very minimal. And Sony's no different, right? Without MLA, you don't get that huge jump. So Bravia 8, it remains to be seen what the value proposition is in terms of getting that premium over the A80L, because I believe the XR Clear is very similar to last year, with the only exception being the accuracy mode if you watch Prime. Right, now, for the big boy, the Bravia 9. So, it, and you saw during the countdown how when you strip out and you look at the dimming zone and the mini LED and that level of control, not just the number of dimming zones uh, that is impressive on the Bravia 9 because over a certain point, it is diminishing returns, right? We've said it many times before, unless it's a true dual cell, whether it's 800, 900, 1100 dimming zones, at this point, it's how well you control those zones, right? Because there's always that trade-off between black crushing, amazing contrast, but you lose shadow detail, or you have all the shadow detail, but you have blooming, right? So with shadow detail and the correct brightness, you're gonna get a little bit of blooming, or the other way, you're gonna dim the specular highlights, but get perfect blacks. That's why you get an OLED. OLED gets that, the problem is you dim the highlights. And so when Samsung went the other way and tried to give you back those highlights, people complained of blooming. And that was the last year's Q195C and 90C. So this year, uh, you know, it's, it's, you can't win, right? And that's why you get an OLED. And the price is very similar. However, this mini LED, this use case is slightly different. You're still gonna have that trade-off, but what Sony is saying is this. Not only have they improved the black levels and the shadow detail, yes, you'll still get a little bit of blooming, but it's designed to watch scenes where it's 4,000 nits in a bright scene. This is something OLED cannot do. No OLED can do this, which is the scene is already bright. 
let's say the entire scene is 400 nits, 300 nits. No OLED could get above 300 nits full screen. So this Sony Bravia Matte will have a bright scene, so you're on the beach, and then the sun is there, and that sun is 4,000 nits. So you have this beach scene at 400, 300 nits, and then you have a spot of sun or clouds that is up to 4,000 nits. That scene is only possible on the Bravia 9, and that's the critical distinction is there is no issues of black level or shadow detail. It's all about specular highlights within a realistic scene. The beach, the park, where you have the sun, right? Now, what makes this really impressive is, okay, so let's say you have a darker scene, right? You're at a park, shaded trees, and you have bright sunlight going through the trees. And you're gonna say, aha, in that scene, what about the leaves? Do they get black enough or there, is there blooming? Well, that's the thing. If the sun is that bright, you're going to see that the shadow detail will not be perfectly black anyway. It will be slightly lifted, and that still looks natural. And so the Sony Bravia 9 makes a case for itself in those scenes. Obviously, if OLED could get to 4,000 nits specular highlights up to 2 or 3% window and perfect blacks, that would be the holy grail. But OLED cannot get a full APL of above 250 to 300 nits. It, it would just burn out and cause burn in. I mean, it's the power board is not designed to do all of that. And ironically, Mini LED is now more efficient at a certain brightness level than OLED. Now, QD OLED, W OLED is not as efficient as QD OLED. So, QD OLED, so let's talk about QD OLED. Do you need this brightness? So, the answer is no, not today. The 4000 nit mastering monitors that this Bravia 9 was designed to do. So, at the Sony event, they had the Bravia 9, they had the Samsung QN90C, and they had the 4000 nit mastering monitor. They had content alpha. So, that's why I've been showing that movie Alpha, that caveman movie where he's running and there's like a sun, the sun is rising. They had the original trim before it went to production they had it at 4000 nits so they were showing us the source the waveform 4000 nits spot on and the monitor showed where the 4000 nit was and then they showed the tvs next to it and only the bravia 9 was able to come close to that wow that impact of that sunrise at 4000 nits and the various scenes so alpha is the movie that movie well, I, I pulled over the um, the person that was in charge. I said, wait, I want to use this content. You're telling me that if I get it on Kaleidoscape, I'm getting 4,000 nits? And he started laughing. He goes, I don't think so. I'm like, what? He goes, well, we know this is 4,000 nits. However, what made it to video, I cannot guarantee. On because he has the source video. So I was like, can you send me the source video on a USB or something? He goes, no, I can't do that. But ultimately, we are in the search for 4,000 nit content, legit. And this one is legit, but it came directly from their video editing machine. I mean, this was on the software and they just said, okay, this is what we wanted. Whether it made it to disk is another difference. So it's something that I will work closely with Sony to find out. All right, guys, you guys are releasing movies, you know, Columbia classics, all of that. Give me your 4,000 nit movies and give me the timestamp where I can find it. Because if you're going to sell the Bravia 9 and you're going to sell me the reference monitor, I'm going to have to be able to demo the waveform or all this is going to come crashing down on your head. So, but guys, you tell me, are you guys curious about 4,000 nits at all? Or such content is still too much. You wouldn't even watch such content. All right, we got here a super chat. Hey, thanks, AB, for that. Where is the Bravia cam? That's more important than the television itself. <laughs> I was waiting for that question. And so the Bravia cam, I actually asked them, and they laughed at me and said, that still is a work in progress because I was saying, wait, how about this for the Bravia cam, right? What, what if I yelled out 4,000 nit content, you know, with the Bravia cam and then, you know, my excited face and the lighting, can you find me 4,000 nit content? The answer is, we're not there yet, but yeah, the at the actual event, there was no mention of Bravia Cam. So I think they're still looking for a reason to use it, but right now that is not the case. <laughs> Thanks for that, AB. Trust AB to advocate for the Bravia Cam. I think I have three of them. 
in boxes in my garage. It's like I put up the TV and I leave the property cam in the box. I should just go to eBay and sell them all. All right, let's see. Any questions, my friend? And let's see. Oh, the Bravia 3. Okay, so there is no Bravia 3, but there's a Bravia 5, I believe. So the Bravia 5, I'll just leave that up there. So the Bravia 5 is their step below the X90L, and it doesn't get the new calibrated Amazon Prime either. That's why I didn't show it off. I mean, at that point, I think you're really digging into sony's super entry level that didn't get any love i don't think i mean at that price you might as well get a u7n by high sense or the tcl qm7 it'll probably be similarly priced and will outperform it like crazy outperform it all right oh there is a bravia 3 and there's a bravia wait maybe it was was it three, seven, eight, nine? Anything under seven, I just ignore it. Maybe there was a four, but yeah, I, I would say the Bravia three, I cannot comment on because they did not make a big deal out of it. And so by not making a big deal, it tells you where that is in their lineup, right? So yeah, is it the Bravia three? I don't know. Bravia 3.5, as far as I'm concerned, it does not exist. But maybe if you plug in a Bravia cam to the Bravia 3, magic happens, right? Yes, Ephraim, these are all the 2024 models, the Bravia 7, 8, and 9. So let's talk about their naming convention. So they got away from the less intuitive XR whatever or X95L. Like the L has no meaning other than the generation. The number 95 has no meaning other than its 95 so bravia at least they're trying to brand bravia as their thing right so bravia means it's their tv which is why i don't think they should have had a bravia 3 because the 3 is not bravia quality i mean might as well just call it tv then you know if if you're not going to make bravia special why are you giving it to everyone it's like diminishing the value of, of a rolex yeah i got an entry-level rolex for 100 bucks suddenly the rolex name is gone if you're getting an entry level Rolex for 100 bucks. So, I mean, it's too late now, but Sony should never had any Bravia under a seven, like the X90L. So, here you're already bidding between the Sony X90L and the Bravia 3. Like, is the Bravia 3 better than the X90L? Of course not. The X90L is a better TV, but it's not called a Bravia. And so, I was led to believe that the Bravia 7, 8, 9 are better than the X90L because the X90L is not Bravia. And then you have that Bravia 3. I'm like, what? You guys went crazy with a Bravia word. Okay, so next year, let's just eliminate Bravia from anything less than a seven. And I was also thinking, well, what are they gonna call it next year? Bravia 7.1, 7.2. So they're gonna have a generation to generation confusion because you would have to either call it Bravia 9 Mark II or Bravia 9.1 or Bravia 9B, 9C. So let me know, how do you get the next generation to separate itself from this Bravia 789 because in a single digit, next one would have to be 7B, right? Or 7C. So I don't know. I don't know how they're going to go. I guess we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But given that this Bravia is such a big name change for them, I expect this to be a two-year TV. The Bravia 9, I don't think we'll be changing it anytime soon. They spent so much time and resources to get this right on the Bravia 9. I expect this to be out for at least two years before they make a change to it. So now the 8 is W OLED. You add an MLA and it becomes Bravia 8.5, whatever. And the Bravia 7, I think is probably going to hold as is because ultimately with 8 times the number of dimming zones, all it's missing is that precision dimming technology that's on the Bravia 9 but the minute you give that to the 7 it's going to be expensive and then you might as well just get the 9 right so a lot of people don't realize that that precision dimming is what separates it allows it to get super bright while controlling that brightness all right let's see what questions you got here oh thank you for that super chat Ahmad Doshan to be honest I'm only here to know if there will be a 2024 Sony QD OLED release the answer is no. <laughs> so hopefully that gets that out of the way. The Bravia 8 is 
W OLED, which is mostly the same as the Sony A80L, with the exception being that additional Amazon Prime calibrated mode, unique to the 7, 8, and 9 series this year. Now, if you're looking for QD OLED though, so let's just talk about the availability of the A95L. So the A95L, we believe we'll be getting the third generation panel because Samsung Display has stopped making the second generation like whenever it was, November, December, right? They moved over to third generation. And so as soon as Sony sells all or produces all of its A95L with a second gen panel, it will continue to produce A95L, but it will use a third gen panel and we don't know when that transition will be. Maybe we're already there. And more importantly, though, they will adapt their software to be very similar to the second gen. So there's not a huge difference in image quality. And to be fair to the QD OLED third gen, it's just slightly brighter and more efficient. So if Sony is using third gen, image quality will be similar. So it's pretty easy to use software to kind of gimp it a little bit to make it very similar to what you had last year. But with the same amount of brightness, you're using a lot less energy and the you know because it's more efficient, the QD OLED is gonna last longer, less heat, right? So we saw demos at Samsung Display where the third gen significantly dropped its heat emissions. So thermal control is way better. So the Sony A95L that would be using the third gen panel should have better heat control and it should last just a little bit longer. I mean, you know, that's progress, but they're not going to market any of that because as far as they're concerned, it's just a supplier bit. It's not a feature they're going to market. But between you and I, the A95L with a third gen panel, although the image quality won't be that much different, you're going to get improvements in efficiency and probably longevity simply because it's a lower temperature panel at its brightest settings. But yeah, you go. Hopefully that answers your question. And Getty, hey. TV size allocation in the US and Europe. So in the US, for sure, we're getting 65 inch, 75 and 85. There are grumblings that Europe may not be getting the smaller 65, but you guys in Europe, let me know for sure. It's very region specific. And this year, the US at least gets 65 all the way up to 85 inches. I was hoping that the Bravia 9 came in at 98 or 100 inch, but not this year. That would have been awesome. Right? Can you imagine 4,000 nits, but I think, that would violate all the power laws in every country because a 100 inch TV pulling out 4,000 nits, I don't know how efficient it needs to be to get that done without breaking any laws, but yeah, not happening anytime soon until they take care of that. Thank you, Christian, for the super chat. Why no 98 inch sizes? How do you think the 9 will compare to the 900D? So 98 inch size is a carryover of the X90L that will still come in 98 inches, so that's 2023 TV. Now, if Sony does release a 98 inch new Bravia model, it will probably be announced later. We did not see it at our event, but as you know, these things come out when they come out. So when I hear anything, I will let you know. But as of now, I think you're still limited to the X90L from last year. The second part of your question is, how do you think the 9 will compare to the 900D? So the Bravia 9 for sure designed 4,000 nit content, you know, up to a 5% window. This was its design spec. The 900D, Samsung, they were caught flat-footed. So Samsung this year, because you know everyone has a roadmap planned out for at least two years, right? So they already knew what they were gonna do with the 900D this year, about 18 months ago. They were not planning for the 4,000 nit resurgence. Like suddenly everyone wants 4,000 nits, right? So that is going to have to be for next year with a 900E. This year's focus, very much so. And we saw it at CES, we saw it at the events, we saw it at their special uh, developers conference, is it's all about AI processing and motion processing and motion resolution. So the motion resolution on the 900D is for sports because you know it's 8K, you're on an 85 inch TV, you wanna see that golf ball, tiny puck moving very clearly. They spent a lot of time working through that. And then second, upscaling of 480p content. They wanna be known as the best upscaler of 480p content to a large TV whether it's 65, 85 inch, whatever. And that's what they focused on, right? Unfortunately, Sony kind of changed that roadmap for everyone. So TCL and Hisense, since they were already working on four and 5,000 nits, they were there. They're like, yes, 
Sony played into our strategy. LG, similarly, what? What is this 4,000 nit? Where did it come from? Now, the G4, thankfully, is super bright. Not 4,000 nit bright, but it's getting my bright OLED TV victory already because it controls that brightness well. The HDR is amazing. And now that we know 4,000 nit is a benchmark for future TVs, LG can go back to the drawing board for 2025 and work on 4,000 nits. Trust me when I say Samsung is working on it right now because when they saw the 4,000 nit announcement last November, Samsung was like, go, oh, don't, what happened, right? And so they will not miss the boat in 2025. But for 2024, it is processing. And not many of you care about 4,000 nits though. So to be fair <laughs> for consumers, if you had a 4,000 nit TV now, all you'd be watching is Spears and Munsell. There is nothing out there worthwhile that's in 4,000 nits. I mean, there's only so many times you can watch Mad Max, right, or Pan. So now the 900D, the 9, as all of Sony's TV, its specialty is cinema, movie watching, skin tones, color accuracy. The 900D, if you look at all of its hyperbole, marketing material, sports, resolution, action. Now, it doesn't mean the 900D isn't accurate. In filmmaker mode, it looks fine, right? But the Samsung 900D is more for those enthusiasts who they want to game because we all know Samsung gaming is quite good on the 900D as an LCD TV goes. And they do a great job with all those features designed for gamers, motion resolution. You like soap opera, they are the best in the business, soap opera motion processing. Sony is just focused on getting that whole cinema from the film, to the living room, and that was our entire theme at the Sony event. We were participating with Sony, watching how they make movies, we were in the studios, we were watching the volume, right, the special effects room, where the entire room becomes the Sony, Enter uh, Sony, <laughs> Star Trek Enterprise. It is a Sony Enterprise. So we're like, wow, this feels like you're in the Enterprise, right? Because it encapsulates such a huge space I mean, they recreated, you could be in the Game of Thrones, right? You could see the desert, you could see Dune. And so they wanted to demonstrate to us that they know how movies are made and what they need to do to, to preserve that original source feel on their TVs. And that's their focus. Samsung's focus is like, look, we don't care about how movies are made. We want you to enjoy your TV. So for them, there's a, it's a lot of quality of life you know, transitioning from your phone to your TV seamlessly, and then have quick settings that look right to you. Filmmaker mode, dynamic mode, sports mode, whatever it is. So the focus is very different. The 900D is designed to appeal to most people. And that's why they're the number one selling TV brand in the world. The Sony, they're totally into, we are the cinema purists TV, and they want to demonstrate that. So the 9 is... It's safe to get a nine if your focus is movie watching. That's what you don't want to do. Now, if you want to game on the nine, it should work pretty well, but never ever mentioned during our entire event was, hey, the nine is a gaming TV. Whereas Samsung, hey, you know what? Why don't you game on it? Try it out, see how much you like it. Because they're pretty proud of their ability to do a little bit of everything. So now the nine is a great TV all around, but they each have their strengths and weaknesses. You just have to ask yourself, what is your preference? And of course the nine, it's got the Bravia cam. The 900D does not. That could be a game changer for many of you. AB, <laughs> I'm looking at you. All right, let's see what else we got here. Hey, thank you for the super chat, Victoria. I will look for your question. <laughs> I did not see that. So I'll find your question shortly. Just ask again. Lisa, thank you for the super chat. What are the viewing angles on the Bravia 9? Thanks for jumping in right away with the Sony live stream. Well, you're welcome. Speaking of the Sony live stream, I think they're doing theirs right now. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but the viewing angle I thought was pretty good. So obviously off angle, every LCD TV will be slightly washed out. I thought the nine looked fine, but not just fine. It was better than the seven and it was better than their previous TVs. Next to an OLED, the OLED will always appear slightly more saturated, but I could not tell that the nine was not an OLED. That's how good off angle it was. But then at that brightness level, you know, maybe it offsets that, but I thought the nine off angle was definitely acceptable. I would not not choose it based on viewing angles. 
Hey, Ahmad, thank you for that super chat follow-up. Would be great if you could make a video letting us know when Sony starts releasing Gen 3 version of A95L. Sony will never let you know that. No TV maker will, honestly. Even Samsung won't let you know when they transition to the third gen panel. Normally, you would have to go either into the service menu where they have all the codes that only the technicians will know because if they're working on a panel, they want to know if this is a third gen or second gen, right? So you really have to dig into the TV that more likely than not may violate your warranty uh, or the serial number, right? So someone's going to have to come from the factory and say, hey, everything after this serial number or this production date is going to be third gen, but it can never be verified, right? So even if an anonymous source leaks it out, like who is this guy and is he telling the truth, you will always never know. But possibly, I'm just trying to think, you know, what's the, it's really hard, really hard to know unless there is some unique pattern in the pixel structure that is different this year than last year. And then let's say Classy with his microscope phone. If you can see a difference in the pixel pattern, that's the only way to know for us mere mortals. But I'm sure people in the tech TV repair business, they would know. They, they would know what the serial number is. So as soon as that makes its way into the public domain, we will share that. But other than that, I have no way of knowing. Thanks for that question. And hey, Sean, I am here during your time. Hi, FOMO. And Brian and all. Hope all is well. Didn't watch the launch. Q900D are in pre-booking. Oh, let me talk about 900D real quick. It's sold out. So as much as I'm really loving the Bravia 9, Samsung hit it out of the ballpark with the Q900D. So I'll be flying to Electronics this weekend. And <laughs> Robert said to me, I can't get a hold of the 900D. They're selling out like crazy. Like the two he had in store, people just walked off of the display unit. He's like, wait, that's for a FOMO. I don't care. Here's money. I'm taking it. So the 900D is very popular. Now, for whatever reason, people are loving it because it is right now the only flagship 85-inch mini LED available, right? Sony has nothing out. LG doesn't have anything that will match the 900D. So, and of course, Hisense and T-Seal haven't released their flagship mini LED. So if you're looking for an 85 inch mini LED flagship for 2024, it's the 900D and it's flying off the shelves. So Robert is trying to get us a 900D allocation, but he says it's not possible. I mean, he reached out to Samsung. All the distributors are out. He reached out to all of his, and he's the retailer. There is no one with a 900D in stock. So, you know, we'll try and get what we can. But yeah, 900D apparently is a big hit. Good job, Samsung, whatever you're doing, keep on doing it. So uh, back to your question. I was thinking, why not wait for 4,000 nits? And you just answered to Christian, 900D is great for sports, which is my number one priority. Yes, Sean, uh, the 900D, the neural processor for this year, was designed with motion, sports motion in mind. So dynamic mode, sports mode, this motion setting, it's automatically built for sports. Before the other generation, it was just normal motion resolution. This year, they specifically designed it for moving ball, fast action. So you could clearly see soccer ball, football, so uh, baseball, anything, right? There's less of that blur. It's just a lot clearer. and upscaling of lower bitrate content. The 8K, as we say, it's irrelevant. Don't worry about the whole 8K resolution. It's all about the image quality overall. And so, yeah, if, if you really need the 900D for sports, try it out, but it's not, yeah, 4,000 nits. If you want that, it's gonna have to be at earliest next year. I don't even know if Samsung can get it in time for next year, we'll see, but I'm sure they're rushing it out. Thank you for that super chat. And hey, JW, thank you for the super chat just because. And I will now look for Victoria's question. Please ask again, Victoria, I apologize, because not, if it's your first time super chatting, I probably missed your question because it wasn't in there. So yeah, if anyone sees Victoria's question, let me know, or if you can repost it, uh, we'll look for it. Now, you can ask me any question. It doesn't have to be about the Sony launch. Uh, I'm gonna wrap it up in about 15 minutes so you guys could finish watching the Sony stream, but I definitely need to, before we go, I'm going to give you guys use cases, but until we get the TVs in, it's hard to say this is better, this is worse, but at least you know the design objective of Sony. So Symbol73 says, I'm still waiting for an 83 inch G4 to become available in my area. Come on LG. And the reason I put this up is, I will tell you this right now, 
there's going to be a shortage of the G4. I know it's expensive, but this is people's, people have been waiting for the G4. They've been waiting to pay $5,000, $6,000 for an MLA 83-inch OLED. There is no QD OLED at this size. So if you want a bright OLED that easily is as bright as any mini LED, with the exception of the Bravia 9, they're short of that, but get perfect blacks, which the Bravia 9 won't get. But if you want just that MLA power, the G4, got it. And I'm gonna tell you right now, if you thought the 900D is not available, the G4 83 inch with MLA is also unlikely to be available. And I understand if you wanna wait for Black Friday, but definitely you're probably gonna be waiting until next year, which is fine. You'll probably get a better deal. Get it on Prime Day in 2025. That'll be your best chance of getting a G4 at a good price between now and the end of the year. It's going to be selling at its premium pricing. So I don't expect a lot of deals between now and Black Friday. Maybe by Black Friday, there'll be a quick deal. But this TV is going to be a big hit. And it's limited numbers because it's so expensive. So you combine those two. And yeah, it's uh, not going to be easy. Well, Victoria, you have your question. All right. <laughs> Thank you for that again. 5050 Apple TV PS5. So your use case is Apple TV and PlayStation 5. I cannot decide between the A95L and G4. So right there, I see PS5. The G4 is just a very good gaming TV. End of story, right? Everything works on the G5, on the G4 as far as gaming goes now. In normal cinema mode, how much percent higher is the color luminance A95L? How much higher is the brightness of the G4? Or the wrong way to look at it? So Victoria is definitely the wrong way to look at it because you're right looking at the specs that separate them. The color luminance of the A95L will be higher, meaning pure yellow, pure red, pure blue at its brightest point is always going to be richer and more saturated than the G4 at the same brightness because it cannot hold on to that color saturation or that brightness. However, that's at quote unquote that brightness. If you're watching a lot of Apple TV, not a lot of Apple TV content has bright HDR scenes that pushes the color luminance beyond what the G4 is capable of, right? And so that's the problem. Spears and Munsell pushes it beyond what it's capable of. But in watching Apple TV, Apple TV content, Apple content, movies, most movies, like, what is it, the Blade Runner 2049, right? Very dim movie, Alita, G4, and the A95L, when accurate, will look identical. So the A95L's color luminance really is for the more bombastic, brighter scenes. And even then, if it's an action scene, the G4 is slightly less saturated. doesn't make a difference. I think the impact, the brightness impact in those transition explosions on the G4 is more powerful. So as much as I appreciate the color luminance of the A95L for its color accuracy, that would be limited to slow moving scenes that's moody so imagine a darker room you have a bright yellow red flickering candle that's like a thousand nits like super bright red and yellow right that's the scene where the color luminance is fully taken advantage of on the qd oled and on the g4 it would be instead of that bright orange red it'd be more like yellow white light now does that affect the mood Creator's intent, sure, right? The creator intended to be more orange-red, but as a viewer, I don't think yellow-orange, you know, slightly less saturated, really has an effect. In a shootout, the G4 would lose because it doesn't match the reference monitor, but in your home, not a big deal. And if it's Dolby Vision, God forbid, it will lower the brightness of all the TVs because it wants to match the brightness of your TV. So that's what Dolby Vision would do. It will say, oh wait, the G4 is not capable of this brightness. And so actually, let's talk about Adobe Vision. So Adobe Vision will look at the G4 and say, wait, the G4 can get bright, but I'm losing color. I will dim it down so that that red, that deep red and orange will be preserved on the G4. You see the problem. Suddenly, now on Adobe Vision, the G4 looks slightly dimmer. So you have to ask yourself, the Adobe Vision version of this scene, do you want it to be bright, but a little less saturated, or dimmer, but fully saturated? Because now it looks more like a bright SDR scene, in my opinion, compared to the brighter A95L. I would prefer to shut off Dolby Vision's preference for preserving all that color. Give me more of that impact. And that's why if you guys watch my videos and I review TVs, 
I side towards HDR impact because I think that's what most people really like. Their eyes are drawn to it. When you pay the extra money, it's for that brightness, that impact. But cinema purists, they're okay with the A95L being slightly dimmer, just slightly, but preserving all the color. There is no right answer, right? You have to know your preference. So back to your question, Victoria, what is it you prefer? If you want the HDR impact, G4 all day long, because that brightness gives you the HDR impact. And some are saying now it may be artificially elevated, much, very much like what the A95L did with some of its its highlights is kind of elevate that contrast just a touch. If you like that, G4 all day long. But if you prefer to see all the colors in its full glory, but slightly dimmer, then the A95L is for you. I think they're both accurate. It just depends on which creator you're looking at. The HDR impact creator who wants that brightness, that blinding shock, or the creator that wants you to appreciate the color luminance without the shock. Same movie, just different interpretations. So hopefully that helps answer your question. All right. Thank you for that super chat. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, G-Man, soundbars. Oh yes, let's talk about soundbars. Let's do that before I leave. Thank you for the reminder, my friend. All right, let's, let's move in here. All right, let's talk about soundbars real quick. I was so impressed. Okay, let's just get this out of the way. I felt like last years or it's actually more of a 2021 2022 model or 2022 model the a7000 flagship it was okay and the reason why i said it was okay is this it did not outperform the samsung qn 990 series right the 990b the 990c it did not outperform it yet it cost i'd say 50 percent more for no reason other than you have to buy bits and pieces. You get the A7000 separately, you have to get the subwoofer separately, and then you have to get the surround separately. Once you added it up, it was almost $1,000 more. I mean, today you can get the Samsung QN980C for like 800 bucks. It's unbelievable because that sounded as good, if not better than the A7000 system matched to be similar to the 990C. Now the Bravia Bar 9, they went back to the drawing board. So two things they did that I think finally they should have done, and I've been complaining about this for a while. They're doing true room optimization to match, you know, they're doing a DSP check, very similar to the HTA9 to match your room's acoustics, number one. Number two, the immersion now feels vertical. I'm feeling the height. I did not get the height before, right? I just got surround, which is good, by the way. It's great. Bed levels, awesome. Now they're adding a bit more volumetric space. So there's some height. And in the demo room, we were watching, of course, Maverick, Top Gun, and a couple of other movies like Venom, where they had really good effects because Sony actually did the sound, right? So we went to Sony Sound Studios before, of course, the Sony Sound Studios to, to feel true Dolby Atmos and true vertical effects of, uh, let's see, we had a couple of movies we saw. We saw Gran Turismo, uh, Maverick, and, and Venom, and we had a, a feel for what it should be like, and then we go and sit in front of the Bar 9, their flagship Bar 9, and it had the Bar 9, the surround satellites were the same, they had the Bar 9, so if you were to buy it, you'd buy the Bar 9, you'd buy the surround satellites, and you'd buy the SW5 subwoofer, and wow, I was like, this, I need this at M-Wave. So I called Sony, I need to bring this to M-Wave because I think I could convince people not to get a $5,000 system and get this instead. Like whatever the system is, if it's under $8,000, I don't know. This is pretty good, especially in a medium-sized room. Obviously, when you're paying extra, you could fill a large room. But in a medium-sized living room, right, this is so good that I don't think you should spend more. And this also applies to the Samsung QN990C, by the way. So it depends on how much this ends up costing. But if it's like $500 more than 990C, that might end up being worth it. But I was very impressed, very impressed by the immersion, the clarity of the dialogue. So that's the bar nine. Now the quad is the new version of the HTA9. So the HTA9 was their first attempt at that, the four speakers, place it anywhere you want. What was the number one complaint? Oh, I get dropouts. They specifically addressed that on the quad. So let's put sound quality aside. That's a different discussion we're gonna have real quick. But I wanna address the number one complaint about the HTA9 is the Wi-Fi 
wireless dropout. So on the quad, what they did is added two separate antennas using different frequencies that bounce back and forth, constantly measuring which gives them the best consistent sound quality concurrently. So if one is weak, they go to the other one. So it's seamless. They hop between frequencies back and forth. I'm sure there is some kind of a buffer to make sure that all happens seamlessly, right? But ultimately, this is supposed to eliminate dropouts. And they were not able to do that the first generation because they didn't realize how bad these... The, like your home has so much interference. So they took all of that into account, right? So, you know, they did, their engineers had a room full of Wi-Fi interference of all types. And this is how they stress tested it. So this should be class leading, seamless, because before, what would you have to do? The HTA9, you cannot have it near a router. It has to be a line of sight. I mean, there were so many things to help reduce the likelihood of a wireless dropout. The quad appears to have addressed that. Now, let's talk about sound quality. So the sound quality of the quad is very similar to the 9 in the immersion. However, and I asked them, they wouldn't answer the question, so I'll answer the question for you. I said to them, look, both of these systems are very similarly expensive, right? They're about the same price. They're both your flagship. But if I was to take one to represent the best of the movie watching experience at M-Wave, because I'm trying to convince people, look, you don't need to get a Storm Audio or a Denon flagship or a Trinov if you only need 90% of that performance at under $5,000. This is how close you can get. Which would you give me to test out at M-Wave? Because these guys are enthusiasts, right? They, they have a pocket full of money ready to spend. What do I need to convince them, start with this and save up for that extra level, like a super giant dual 21 inch subwoofer that this cannot do. But this is a good band-aid, the bar nine or the quad. You know what they said to me? Oh, they're both our children. We cannot decide they're both flagships. I'm like, what kind of answer is this? So ultimately, let me tell you what they told me. The quad is the designer's choice. So if you see the images of the quad, you can hang it on a wall, very flexible, very thin. So ultimately, if you don't want to see your speakers, because a lot of people do not like the appearance of a sound bar just below their TV, the quad sounds, quote unquote, as good as the nine, but there's a flexibility. You could move it anywhere. Like the HTA9, you could put it on the wall, you could put it on stands, you know, you can make it disappear and it will still immerse you with sound. But ultimately, I've extrapolated that if sound quality, surround sound quality is what you want, go with the bar nine. Because the quad, their design objective is the form is more important than the function because some people, they really want to get something that is out of the way. You cannot help but add some compromises there. The bar nine, its specific objective is to be the best in dialogue, right? Oh, that's another thing is mentioning dialogue. Very similar to the Samsung, they were showing us how they can separate dialogue and then raise that dialogue. It's pretty effective. So they were showing us scenes where you, you had a hard time hearing the dialogue because the source content was that way. And then, oh, wow, it's like you pulled out the dialogue channel. So Samsung's doing that this year with its QN990D and Sony's doing it with the Bar 9. So. If you watch movies like, was it Tenet, where you could barely hear the dialogue, either the 9, the 990D should be able to pull out the dialogue very well. But other than that, though, I have to say the 9, very impressive. The quad, back to back, I heard them back to back. And I felt the quad was good, like the HTA 9 was, but it just, I just felt more immersion from the 9 because I had a dedicated, very large soundbar plus two dedicated satellites was the quads were you know what if i'm an enthusiast i go with the nine if i don't care that i have a soundbar i go with the nine but the quad is not not that much of a drop off so if that helps you guys decide let me know if you have any questions about either one and the eight is just an affordable i mean if you're going with the eight get the 990c so this is what i would say the bar eight obviously is ex expensive than the bar nine but at that price, you might as well get last year's Samsung 990C for $800. That will beat anything in 2024 for $800. So that's just something, if you guys are in the market, just keep in mind. All right. Oh, 
more question. Thank you. So you hit the super chats real quick. Thank you again, Sean. Thanks for coming at this time, which suits me. I know. I thought of you, Sean. Will Sony 9 and Samsung versus LG 8K be out of spring shootout? So, no, because first of all, the Samsung, if you missed it, we're having problems getting it for ourselves. Uh, all the allocations from all the Samsung distributors, they're sold out. So, and, and Robert sold out of his demo units. The game just took it. Oh, I don't care. I'll just buy it uh, because he had to calibrate it to show it off. They just picked it up and left. So we don't have, as of today, he's trying to get me one for our spring shootout comparison, but not there. Now, and the 9 will not be available until June. So let's talk about just the release dates real quick. Uh, the 9, I've been told June, the home theater bar is also June. When exactly in June, I don't know. I'm trying to get it for M-Wave. So it's possible that our first look, all of us, will be at M-Wave. You know, I'm working really hard with Sony to send me the, the Sony Bravia 9 to M-Wave. Whatever TV they can get me, definitely the sound bars, get it to M-Wave. And the LG 8K, so the 8K, the new Z, I think the Z3 was last year's 8K. I don't think it's available at the spring shootout. Now, the 99, I don't think it's available yet either. But I would not put, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I don't think the QNED 99T will be a match for the 9 or the Samsung. I just feel like LG is just rolling it out just because, um, because they did not... You have to follow the money. When you put no marketing into a product, that means the product is not important to you. And that 8K from LG, not important 2024. So just follow the money. I don't, it would not surprise me if the 8K TV ended up being just, you know, like last 8K QNED they had. They just wanted to bring out something that was 8K this year, quote unquote refreshed. The real battle will be between the Bravia 9 and the 900D at some point in the year. So now for the, October shootout, we might have that. So we'll see. I'll try to get that for the October shootout or October, July. So if the Sony comes out in time, we'll have it in July or August for that comparison, but not for this weekend, right? This weekend is happening. So this the spring face-off, we're going to have, we're definitely going to be testing the AI Picture Pro. So we'll see how well that does against Sony's A95L XR Clear. And thank you, Double R. Does Bravi and I have the Master Series branding? You know, good question. I think the Master Series was not emphasized at all. I mean, if it is, it was very subtle. I'll ask them if it gets the quote unquote Master Series. Uh, it's the flagship, but Master Series was not the focus at all as far as the buzzword about because I remember in 2021, when the X95K was released, or was it 2022? When the X95K was released, the word Master Series, this is a Master Series, right? I mean, that was like emphasized. Now it's just Bravia 8, 9, 7, 3. But the word Bravia is the focus. But I will ask them. They treat it like a Master Series, though, for sure. So uh, if not in name, definitely in spirit. Will I have the MediaTek Pentonic 1000 chip? No mention as to what chip is being used. That's going to be something I'll have to look at the display supply chain information to see. Also, were the exact improvements to the XR processor. So the exact improvements, I would say, on the 789 is the calibrated prime video mode that is unique to those three models. The versions of video streams from Amazon Prime they have unique streams for 7, 8, and 9. The minute you connect your TV to the internet, Amazon will recognize which TV you have and will send you a stream optimized for that TV so you don't have to touch the settings. Basically, it recognizes, oh, it's an Amazon Prime feed. They talk. Boom. The connection is made. And that is the biggest improvement to the XR family of features but xr clear itself appears to be unchanged in those things and obviously the nine is all new so it's not so much the xr clear but it's dimming algorithm it's precision dimming it uses hardware that is unique to the nine which means that the dimming zones and the mini led they can control the light better than any other tv out there so if you watch my my countdown in the countdown you'll see when you strip the LCD away and you see the dimming zones and mini LED in action, the Samsung, it's, e it's like three settings, right? It's either bright, 
medium or off, right? It's one of those three. Whereas the Sony, there's a lot of gradients in between bright and off. And it's those extra gradients that helps them control blooming a little bit better in the brighter scenes. So hopefully if you're considering the nine, that helps answer your question. And Sean, thank you for that super chat. My experience with all Q900 ABC have been, they get brighter and better by year end. Yes, firmware updates, Samsung does a good job with the little things for their flagship TVs. So I'm expecting the AI to get much better too. It, well, AI, learning AI, right? Now in this generation of training data, the more you train the data, the better it gets. And it looks like Samsung may be using a large, well, it's neural network is getting better, right? It's training data, all of that over the year, over the course of years, as long as its processor is able to keep up, it should work pretty well with firmware updates. Now, does firmware update improve brightness? No. So if your brightness ceiling is a certain amount, remember, um, energy consumption is important. So it actually might get worse in order to avoid violating energy laws. It will rarely get better. Now, the only way it gets better is if, for example, it ends up vignetting the outer side to make it a little dim on the outside and then take that energy saved and put it into the center. So perceptually, it might look brighter. Oh, these parts look a little bit brighter, right? The spectral highlights, that's because it's taking energy from other parts of the scene. So the entire scene may have the same average picture level, but different parts of the scene might appear brighter by dimming other parts because you want that specular highlight. So perceptually, it might look a little different. Now, whether they can do that in a firmware update, though, is a whole other matter. That might be processors processor specific there's only so much you can do with firmware right because you're limited by what the the chip the native processor can do and firmware is normally things like a new feature like a specific feature like dolby atmos hdmr eARC, enhanced arc or a certain you know vrr where the feature is there latent they just have to clean it up before they enable it but as far as making things brighter it's very rare or, well, accuracy though. So you could have different color color changes like the S95B, literally in one firmware, it went from EOTF being too bright to more accurate. So they can make it more accurate. So if it ends up being too dim to start, it could get brighter by raising the EOTF. So that they can do, but not beyond what the TV is designed to do, so to speak. So I guess, yeah, conceivably, if people complain, hey, this is an EOTF curve out of the box, it's too dim. They could bring back that EOTF curve to make it accurate because they did that last two years ago, the S95B. It started off too bright and suddenly it dimmed down. And everyone got upset, right? So uh, yeah, conceivably they could do that, but they would not be able to break the limit of what they need to be at in order not to break any energy laws. So you have to keep that in mind, Sean. I'm sure the TV is capable of more. They also have to, huh, you know what? We, we don't want to be fined either. And 900C HDR on dynamic mode was great by year end. I'm, I'm enjoying dynamic mode right now on the S95D. Okay, actually, you know what? I have to talk about dynamic mode. I am definitely impressed by the dynamic mode on both the S95D and the G4. The A95L's vivid mode has always been very accurate, but it ends up being more like standard mode. So the Sony, that's why it feels a little dim. The G4, I think right now has the best vivid mode if you turn on AI genre. So when you go in the settings on the G4, they have all the different AI settings, right? When you put on AI genre, it recognizes you're watching a movie. So this is what I love. I'm in vivid mode, right? Everything's too blue and it's like the green is too crazy. I turn on AI genre and suddenly the colors all shift to be closer to accurate while preserving much of that brightness. I was like, this is what I'm talking about. And that's why G4 is like, wow, I can watch movies like this, Marvel action movies, Tom Cruise movies, right? Mission Impossible. G4 in vivid mode with AI genre enabled, rock solid. It, it's not annoying. Normally it's, it's kind of annoying. I, I cannot watch movies in that mode, but with AI genre, I'm really enjoying it. Okay, hey, thanks for the super chat. Keep AirPods Pro Gen 2 or consider Bravia Theater U, wearable speaker, Apple Vision Pro user. Oh, wow. <laughs> huh, let's see. Ah. Uh, 
Bravia Theater wearable. Okay, so I have, I actually wore the Bravia speaker. Um, it was designed, you're in a, in, a, in a room, you don't want the baby to cry. It's a personal speaker. I was very impressed. As a matter of fact, if I didn't have this system and I got a cheaper TV, like a Sony, let's say the Bravia 3. The Bravia 3 with that wearable elevates the Bravia 3. That wearable is very effective. Now, it doesn't have the subwoofer base, but the surround effect was impressive. So surround, dialogue, not much of a subwoofer, but it went low enough to get, you know, you know there's something there, but definitely, you know, when you are wearing a personal device, it's actually pretty good. And it's not over your ears, so you can still hear the room around you, the doorbell ringing, whatever. So I'm a big fan of the new Bravia wearable device now it was designed for gaming so the latency is nil right so it's designed for gaming but they had us game while you know, ps5 while wearing it as well as watching movies i just loved watching the movies i th i thought that wearable was great now let's see airpods pro gen 2 if you're using the pro gen 2 for your iphone i don't know if you can replace it by wearing the bravia theater but if you're considering just for movie watching the bravia theater I, I like the sound to be out in the ear it's a bit too in your head i don't like that experience for movie watching i mean if i have to i have to right but i, I would do the wearable thanks for the super chat all right, Getty. So, uh, thank you for the super chat. Any word on when Hisense TCL will be released? So Hisense let me know that they're only just getting their review units right now. So it looks like my guess is going to be a May to June releases for both of them, and, and which is very similar to last year, right? Last year, if you guys noticed, Hisense TCL, they're pretty consistent with their June releases. I don't expect any differently this year and sony is also going to be a june release as well so maybe all three will come out in june so if samsung and lg want to sell their tvs quickly better sell it now because once these tvs come out in june that's it man it's off to the races but thank you again for coming by taking last calls for any questions relating to anything including sony's 2024 tv lineup or their bravia sound system bar the bravia theater bar <sighs> g4 it is yeah like if i was to have a go-to tv and i don't know anything about you other than this is your budget this is your size and you want everything little gaming hdr whatever right I would recommend the G4. It is definitely every man's flagship. Without knowing your use case, I feel comfortable saying it's every man's flagship because everything kind of works. Dolby Vision works. The gaming system works now. All their features work. They have 144 kilohertz. Uh, they have a great heat control. You know, they were one of the first with their their heat sink. It works very well. The MLA is bright. It's efficient. Colors are impactful. Out of the box is very color accurate. Well. All the flagships are, by the way. It's not unique to the LG, but right out of the box, and it looked as good as my calibrated G3, right? So the G4 is a good go-to flagship if you know nothing other than I want a really great image quality and I do a little bit of gaming. It goes up to 83 inch in terms of MLA, rock solid. Not cheap, but you know, you gotta pay for the expense. And I think it has the least compromises. But to be fair, I have not compared audio. I, I should, and I might do it at the spring shootout this weekend, but for sure, the S95D audio is loud, but it's missing a lot of information below 120 hertz. Uh, whereas the S90D, same volume, but it goes all the way down to like probably 80, 90. So it feels there's more mid bass there. So for sure, if you need good audio, the G4, I don't know yet. Can I answer that question? But the S95D, you definitely need a soundbar. No way around it. Safe to say, this is your mini LED. This is the year of Sony's mini LED for sure. Hisense looks amazing on the low end. The U7 series, the U6 is, is going to be mini LED, of course. And TCL's QM7, QM8, they're affordable. They're going to be powerful. How close do they get to the Bravia 9? I honestly believe they will 
probably beat the Bravia 7. Pure guessing on my, on my part, only because I sense that they're going to go after that contrast impact because they're going to have enough dimming zones to do it. And for them, it's not about shadow detail. It's about that deeper black and that contrast, which is what catches most people's eye. Sony coming for the high end. Yes, the Bravia 9. And OLED G4 is OLED's OLED's swan song this year for 2024 is the G4. Thank heavens that was released. Otherwise, OLED would not have a shot this year at all. So, yeah. And catch some more of your questions real quick. And thank you for swimming by, everyone. Yes, Michelle. FOMO kept the pic personalized picture mode. I don't know why. I guess it's popular. I used it once last year. It did not turn out well for me. Everything looks like a cartoon. That's <laughs> so terrible. All right. I am Blue Zan. Blue Zan. I thank you for the super chat. Guesses for maximum size 97 dates and pricing. So I don't have to guess. We know 65 inch all the way up to 85 inch. Uh, there's nothing larger than 85. You want larger? You want 98 inch? You go with last year's X90L. Dates, June release date for the 9. I don't know about the 8 and 7, but let's just assume they're all releasing in June. Pricing, I think a lot of them have been leaked already, but I believe the 9, even the 50, uh, 65 inch, it doesn't come in at 55. So the 65 inch, I think it's probably like 2600 or something like that. So it's it's going to be the same price as the G4. Ultimately, you have to decide 4,000 nits, Sony Bravia 9, and it's they're very proud of its sound system. So I expect the Bravia 9 to have a better louder sound system than the G4, but you know, what is it you prioritize, right? If you watch Amazon Prime, I'm definitely gonna have to put it head to head, right? The Bravia 9 versus the G4, watching Amazon Prime movies. We'll do rental movies, right? We'll see how they compare. And Amat, thank you for the super chat. Would you recommend a 42 inch C4 triple display sim racing setup? Oh, pff, absolutely. <laughs> That's like, that is a dream gaming TV. I don't know how many times a day I have to listen to Brian just wax poetically about how much he loves the 42-inch C4. He said it's the best gaming monitor he's ever owned, bar none. I mean, this is such a keeper for him. So and he's tried gaming on everything. The C4 as a gaming TV, 42-inch, 48-inch, right? you're sitting close, you don't need that extra MLA, you know, you don't want to go blind. You'll be very happy. I, I think triple display 42 inch C4, 144 hertz. Are you kidding me? Oh, yeah, no. This, hey, Ahmad, tell me how it goes. That is a no brainer. I, I don't, I mean, I guess you could argue the QD OLED, but it's a smaller, it's 32 inches. They don't have anything larger than that. And the one they do, it's not 4K, right? Their largest 4K is a 32 inch QD OLED. This is it. Uh, yeah, 42 inches, SIM. I, I have a few friends that are doing that. and it's so good oh man that's a good setup and looks like the prices are on the electronicsony.com website thank you Lisa yeah check it out my friends well no well no Michelle they will oh, okay you know what let's let me roll that back because I know HDMI is going to call me you're wrong HDMI 2.1 means everything now if it could play 4K 30 guess what it's HDMI 2.1 so let's be specific 40 gigabit bandwidth and above right 40 42 48 right high bandwidth hdmi for gaming and why do you need the high bandwidth it's because 4k hdr 120 right 4k hdr 120 so you're going 10 bit hdr at 120 you need 40 gigabits per second and above and especially 144 hertz right sony only has two high bandwidth ports and most makers only have two. A few have four, like LG and Samsung on their flagship or their higher end TVs. Everyone else only has two because MediaTek is only supporting two on one chip. If you want four, you gotta get two of those MediaTek chips. So until MediaTek creates a SOC that has four, you're gonna be limited by two. And maybe this year they will. So I'm just throwing out what's been happening in prior years. This year again, Sony has said, nope, we have two. People aren't complaining about two. So let me know, Michelle, if you're a gamer, that's why you need uh, the additional two. But the reality is they're only going to support two because they don't want the extra expense. They don't think it's necessary.
And Sean, thank you for the super chat, my friend. Can a person go to OLED after having a 900 series two years when sports is prime importance because dimming is an issue or is it less now? Since no many LEDs shoot out till June, I need a TV. So what is your size, Sean? I will tell you, I've already tested the G4. It preserves its brightness without dimming in hockey, right? Full white screen, vivid mode. It is brighter than the S95D, definitely brighter than A95L. It is slightly brighter than the QM8 in no dimming. So vivid mode, sports mode on the G4. If 83 inches is all you need, yes, you can go with the G4 in vivid mode. Amazing. Now, the 900 series has other features. If you like those features, you know, they're not directly translating over, but the G4 can do it. I don't think there is any other TV that size. So actually, I know there isn't. It's the only one with the MLA. There's no QD OLED that size. So prime is sports and uh, prime sports is of prime importance. And if you watch sports in dynamic mode, you have to go with the G4. Now, if you watch sports in filmmaker mode, right? You're in a dark room. You don't need it that bright. So if you watch in filmmaker mode, then you have the A80L at 83 inch. You have the C4 at 83 inch. But if you are watching a dynamic mode, you have to get a TV that's similarly bright. And the only one that comes close right now is the G4 83 inch. But then you'll appreciate the bit of contrast, I think. So the 900 for sports should be fine. Uh, only because the 900C for sports is fine, right? So the 900D is more of the same, but the G4 adds something to your determination, for sure. All right, you guys are awesome. Thank you for showing up, my friends. And don't forget to click like, so that people can watch this. I know SD, you could turn off the brightness in filmmaker mode. You could put the S95D in active, or you could watch cinematic cinema home. But come on, you know vivid mode just gets it that touch brighter. But yeah, you could always turn well, even max brightness in filmmaker mode, you have to go into for the LG, I'd say Cinema Home Dynamic Tone Mapping on. It comes fairly close to Vivid. Vivid has a touch more blue, but yeah, I mean at that point. Bravia 9 is the chief model. It's their equivalent master series this year. And love for the Samsung S95D. <laughs> it's a good TV, guys, except you guys saw the issues with, with um, anti-glare. But for most people in a normally lit room with no crazy brightness, it actually does a good job of the ref of battling reflection. And, and I got a lot of viewers telling me they actually enjoy it, right? They were too embarrassed to publicly say, like, oh, I don't want to get trolled. But a lot of people did get the S95D based on our discussion that, look, if you have weird brightness in your room where you see yourself in the reflection, I mean, that's the issue, right? You're in the TV. You don't like seeing yourself reflecting off the TV. S95D completely eliminates that, and that is its primary use case. And those who have that issue, they they love it, and and they and it is definitely a step brighter than the S95C. So you have that as well, and its tone mapping is a little bit better as well. So and hey, Michelle, one of those filthy gamers, I love you. All right, should I buy a Bravia 7 or X95L? No 65 inch Bravia 9 in EU. Aw, so oh, this is so hard for me to decide because I honestly don't know if the 7 is quote unquote going to look better than the 9, 95L because we don't have a 65 inch in the US. So it's pure speculation on my part. Normally, I tell you to get the newer version of a similarly equipped TV, meaning the hardware specs are similar. The 7 and the 95L appear to have similar specs in terms of dimming zone number and all that, but the 7 has the updated processor that has optimized Prime, Amazon Prime. So if your retailer allows you to watch it side by side or in the same room running back and forth, I would do that, but I suspect they'll be very similar. Like if you don't watch Amazon Prime, 
get the X95L and save some money, I would say, because at this point, they're so similar. Uh, the 7 does not have that precision dimming zone that the 9 does, Bravia 9, so you're not benefiting from that anyway. So I suspect the 7 is very similar to the 95L. So if you multiply eight times the number of dimming zones, eight times the 90L had, what, 30 dimming zones, something like that. So 30 times 8, 240. So at 65 inches, you're having maybe 240, 300 dimming zones, which is very similar to the 95L, maybe just a touch less. They'll, they'll perform very similarly, I think. So get the cheaper one. If Amazon Prime is not your thing. If it is, you might want to go with the 7, just so you can have the latest and greatest. Oh, wait. I missed a super chat. One second. All right. Hamza, I will get to your super chat right now. Thank you for reminding me, my friend. Sorry about that. I'm just like all over the place. I'm so excited. I finally get to share with you this embargo information. And I have to say, I'm going to complain to Sony. Guys, don't put the embargo so far from the event. I mean, by the time I get to the launch date of sharing information, I have forgotten some of the details and the excitement is more muted. Thank you for the super chat, Hamza. 85 inch Bravia 9, a good upgrade over the 77 inch S90C. Wow, two completely different TVs. It's a good upgrade. Number one reason, it's slightly larger. Number two, definitely brighter. So, Hamza, if you watch mostly in a bright room, the 9 is going to be amazing because now you can unleash it and the ambient light, well, you know, your eyes will adjust and you'll get this impact that you cannot get from the 90C in that same ambient light because the 90C, its full screen brightness is limited. Like its average APL, its average picture level cannot exceed 300 nits, period. It's just, it cannot do that, right? Its power board will not let it do that. Do that. And if it did, it would probably end up with a burn in risk. So you already know that there is a physical limit to how bright the 90C can get. The Bravia 9 is not limited by that, mostly because the mini LED is more efficient. It could put up more brightness using similar amounts of energy, but more importantly, it's designed to go bright average picture level with super bright specular highlights. So Hamza, if you're only watching Friends or Colombo, not a big deal. You don't need the Bravia 9. But if you're going to start watching, let's say, Amazon Prime, and Prime is going to start producing videos that take advantage of 4,000 nits, by the way, because they want to separately separate themselves from Netflix. So if you want 4,000 nit content that's coming sooner rather than later, the 9 is a great upgrade because it's bigger. First, second, it is definitely a step up in brightness. Now, if you want to stay OLED, you got to go with the G4. So this is what I would say. Get the 85 inch Bravia 9, probably similar price to the G4 83 inch. And then when the G4 gets its uh, blue, the phosphorescent blue update in 2026, right? So the G6, maybe G7, at the 97 inch size, so you have an upgrade path. 85 inch Bravia 9, five years from now, get a 97 inch MLA equipped OLED G8 with a or G9 with a phosphorescent blue, right? I mean, that is going to be that next level up. So yeah, nine now, and in five, six years, when it's time to replace the TV, get yourself a 97 inch MLA OLED. I think you will love that. And it'll probably be more affordable too. And thank you for the super chat, Sean. Sports in a bright room. Always, I feel, will take the Q900D 85 inches as you said, and if hopefully AI takes care of DSE. Yeah, AI does not take care of DSE, unfortunately. That's a manufacturing defect. Uh, if it doesn't, then the Sony 4000 nits can try. 4000 nits may have brighter DSE. All correct, Sean. This is all we're hoping. Now, the good thing is, as a master series, quote unquote, Sony does a, a good job of binning their TVs, meaning they select their quality LCDs with the least amount of vertical banding. That's why it costs so much. You're paying for the rejected LCD panels that have DSE. So in theory, the Bravia 9 should have less DSE than any other mini LED. That's what you're paying for essentially. So you know what, you know, try something new, my friend. Try the Bravia 9. Let me know how you like it. Did it solve DSE? Because I don't go that big. So you'll have to tell me that 4,000 nits, it's gonna be awesome or your DSE will be incredibly bright. Hey, thank you for the super chat, Double R. No new carry over 83 inch OLED, not for Sony. So the A80L continues as an 83 inch. 
Uh, there is no new 83 inch, but if you want an 83 inch OLED from Sony, it is still the A80L. So that is carrying over. 2025 83 inch QD OLED, maybe. I have not heard any rumblings, but I'll let you know as soon as I find out that it may not be 2025, it may be 2026. And considering that Samsung is working so closely with LG to help offset cost, Samsung may just be selling MLA 83 inch in 2025. I mean, if I was Samsung Electronics, not Samsung Display, if I was Samsung Electronics and I want to maximize cost, I would just source MLA 83 inch directly from LG, cheaper then have Samsung Display retool and borrow more money from the parent company to do that just to sell in small volumes. Uh, it doesn't help the OLED market to fracture the market and keep prices high. If Samsung Electronics sources 83 inch MLA from LG Display, it will lower the price for everyone because with increased volume, right, economies of scale. So for pricing uh, for consumers like yourself, I would rather that Samsung source 83-inch MLA, bright 83-inch OLED from LG Display. That will drive prices lower. If Samsung chooses to go QD OLED, guess what? Prices are not going to drop. Both the 83-inch MLA and the 83-inch QD OLED will be high because you're not benefiting from the scales, uh, economies of scale, right? So you guys let me know, like, are you willing to pay that extra thousand? Because it's going to end up being at least an extra thousand. Or would you rather the price drop by a thousand since Samsung is now sourcing from LG Display, the 83 inch MLA OLED next year? Because they really are on the same team. Uh, I, I know it's been a while since I did a FOMO show, but one of the things that I've been developing and following is Samsung and LG are no longer rivals when it comes to OLED. Samsung Electronics and LG they basically agreed two things. One, if we want the Korean display industry, OLED specifically, to be ahead of China, we have to put together our resources and we have to stop this rivalry because everything that Samsung Display releases is in direct competition with, with LG Display. So yeah, QD OLED has its place. Yes, W OLED has its place. But now we're at this joint we have we have a shared front here against China as a business collective. If I develop Samsung Display, I will spend extra money to literally create the same product you already have that is minutely better. And you guys know, enthusiasts like us will see the difference. But your neighbor, oh, bright OLED, yay, right? They, they're going to watch what? Regular Netflix streaming? They will not be able to tell the difference between an 83-inch QD OLED or an 83-inch MLA. Both LG Electronics and Samsung recognize that. They're like, okay, guys, let's just get together and try to reduce the cost of OLED, which I think is the right move. So, but hey, if you disagree, let me know. And Michelle, hey, thank you for that super sticker. Para character doing a shaka sign with hands saying cool. Thank you, thank you. All right. Okay, uh, we're going to wrap it up. Any last questions I'll take right now and then. We'll see if I can can beat the Sony live stream, Sony.com's live stream. Okay, and of course, Sony 83 inch QD OLED 2025, baby. I love it. And thank you for the super chat, Mark. No question, so I'll look for your question. I did not see a question, so definitely ask it if you had a question for me, Mark. Mozart has a good point. Um, I didn't mention this because I assume you guys all know. So the Bravia 9 is the closest TV we've come to not needing tone mapping, right? This is very exciting. So if you guys don't know, if a source image, right, a movie is brighter than the TV could handle, right? Brighter, brighter than the TV could handle. They have to tone map it down to fit the brightness of the TV. So tone mapping means you take all the different color tones that are super bright and you map it down to what the TV could handle. So if your TV could only handle 1,000 nits, everything above 1,000 nits, you bring it down. And so a lot of TVs have to make a decision. If I go too bright, I'm going to lose color, but I get the brightness without color detail, clipping. So you get the brightness, but it's all white with nothing, right? There's no detail. It's like if you watch the horses scene that I always show, that clipping gives you that bright snow, but the grass is gone. <laughs> so it's just bright snow at 2,000 nits, no grass. 
Or you bring the brightness down to a thousand nits, all the grass is there, but it's no longer 2,000 nits, it's 1,000 nits. So the Bravia 9 at 4,000 nit specular highlight means that any movie graded to 4,000 nit specular highlight, you can see it all in 4,000 nits without having the brightness taken down so you can see all the detail, nor do you have the brightness maxed out, but all the details lost, all you get is that white scene with nothing, right? So that bright sun that normally has rays of color that's above 2,000 nits, you could get all of that now with a Bravia 9 in such a scene. So yes, those kind of scenes, you won't need tone mapping unless it's a 10,000 nit content, right? But as we know, 4,000 nit is already a pipe dream. So any content up to 4,000 nits graded on the new Sony reference monitor capable of 4,000 nits, that's a direct match. And so when they designed the Bravia 9, it was specifically to match content that was graded on the reference monitor that goes up to 4,000 nits, the new one that's released this year. It's a one-to-one -one match in terms of brightness. That reference monitor does not tone map, and so the Bravia 9 will not tone map for that content, hitting that max brightness. So it is exciting, right? Uh, for those that want creator's intent HDR impact with all the color intact, the Bravia 9 is supposed to do that. Oh no, I missed the stream. Why? I don't have notifications. Not your fault. It was mine. I literally just, hey, let's turn on the stream. I forgot today is embargo day. I get to talk about Sony and I've been so busy. If you guys don't know, I've been traveling, going to a wedding, and then I have to prepare for this weekend's spring face-off shootout with the TVs. So I just completely forgot that today was embargo day. I'm so used to not being able to talk about Sony that, whoop. Sean, thank you for the super chat. Is 4,000 nits really needed for TVs? Prime had promised 8K content, but has not till now. What's the biggest challenge for Netflix and Prime to produce such content? Very good question. 4,000 nits really needed for TVs? No. You could watch TV 500, 600 nits, right? Um, was that wonderful movie, Alita? Not higher than 500 nits. Or uh, Blade Runner 2049? Again not higher than five, 600 nits. So you can watch movies without 4,000 nits, obviously. Now, what's needed is accurately showing a movie that was graded in 4,000 nits. That's a different question. So with a new Sony reference monitor, new movies graded on that monitor that took advantage, that will take advantage of 4,000 nits. If you don't want tone mapping and you want all the accuracy of HDR impact with color, then yes, you would need a TV matched to that monitor for that content. Prime had promised 8K content. The problem is the amount of data you saw when I attempted to even watch a trailer in 8K from Prime, right? The, the game of, it wasn't Game of Thrones, it was Lord of the Rings, right? The Lord of the Rings spinoff on Prime. It was a nightmare. There was so much buffering. We cannot handle the data required for 8K. I couldn't rewind. I couldn't fast forward. I could only play, right? So 8K data rates, we don't have the right codec. So it's less about Prime. They have the 8K movies. They don't have the codec. They don't have the right compression system. And they don't have enough bandwidth because imagine globally a million people trying to watch 8K. Not with current codecs. We, we don't have the compression technology yet. Or we have it, but it's not out there yet. What's the biggest challenge for Netflix and Prime to produce such content? So the good news is production of such content is now more affordable, right? You got the Raptors, you got the new Ursa from Blackmagic. These are 8K to 12K cameras that are relatively affordable for production. I mean, you could rent it, you don't have to buy it. And so you have the equipment. Storage fees are dropping significantly. Processing, so you have really amazing processors, GPUs, whether it's Apple, whether it's PC, you can actually grind and crunch 8K well enough. It all comes down to streaming this data. Can, what does it take to stream? How much bandwidth do you need? And remember, they could stream 8K, but if you have a lot of people watching the same content, they're gonna start dropping it down. So even though it's 8K, you might be watching 1080p because they rather you just get the movie rather than have a slow, juddery experience, stuttery experience because they can't get the data to you, they're going to give you a 1080p version of that movie and let your TV just upscale it because too many people are, are streaming the same content. So Netflix does a very good job 
of, of moderating their bandwidth, going from 4K to 2K to 1080p to 720p, depending on traffic, depending on your bandwidth connection. So there's a lot of things happening. And with all of that in mind, both Amazon and Netflix are like, wait, the infrastructure is not yet ready for 8K. So until the infrastructure is there and, you know, net neutrality, let's not even get into net neutrality. Like how much bandwidth will Netflix and Amazon hog up just to get 8K out there? So there's a lot of considerations that have less to do with your TV's ability to do it and more to do with political considerations, bandwidth considerations, energy, like how much energy does it take to decompress and compress 8K? It, more bit rate means more energy, right? So there's there's a lot of considerations there that now that I'm talking about it, I don't think 8K will ever come. <laughs> I was like, well, wait a minute. And let me ask you, Sean, you love sports. Wouldn't you rather have high frequency frame rates? Same data rates, right? So wouldn't you rather watch 4K 120, football, soccer, golf, 4K 120, man, that's amazing motion resolution, right? Rather than 8K 30. I would prefer 1080p 240, right? Rather than 8K 30. So you guys out there, you guys who are gamers, you know, 1080p 240 sports, are you kidding me? Like, amazing. So something to consider, everyone. Correct, buddy. I, I apologize. Get it right, FOMO. The U.S. network is not ready for 8K. Japan already figured it out. But Japan has a smaller population. So, you know, the size of the population, and you're right, uh, you need to have a distribution of, of 8K. I mean, they're going to have to buy more servers to distribute it. But, yeah. You know, and to be fair to the U.S., we're just happy to get 1080p in some parts of the country. So they're still trying to get bandwidth gigabit connections to households forget 8k for now right i think some parts of the world some parts of the u.s are still dial up it's, it's crazy like aol remember that okay i just i gotta go soon <laughs> i have an appointment i'm running on you guys were crazy you were making me stay and i love staying so five more minutes i'm out of here when will the 4,000 nits movie when will thank you sean for the super chat when will 4,000 nit movies or 8k movies become available 4,000 nit movies will become available. Let me see. If they're shooting it now, they just have to... Actually, it's already been shot. They just have to regrade it. I'd say by the end of the year, Sony specifically, Sony Entertainment, they will be releasing likely remastered version of movies that was supposed to be in 4,000 nits, but was not made as 4,000 nits. And I'm going to use, again, that movie Alpha as an example. It was ready to go in 4,000 nits. It was not released in 4,000 nits. So they can go back to their library and start releasing movies that will look better in 4,000 nits. So if they start doing that now, let's say, uh, 2025, I'd say would be when you might see it at Bravia Core. It could be unique to the Sony Bravia Core. That's what I would do if I was Sony. Get them to buy Sony TVs. Look, Bravia Core, you're a member of Core. You get 4,000 nit content. Someone's it's a unique... Front, Someone's out the front door. It's a unique trim. And so I'd say 2025 at earliest, but limited release to certain streaming platforms. I don't think it will come to disc yet. Uh, 8K movies, not for a while. I think 8K comes after 4,000 nits. So I'd say f four years for 8K, maybe longer in the USA at least, and not disc. There is no 8K media available. Uh, it's all going to be streaming if it's out. Keep, it, keep that in mind. Hope Sony doesn't abandon the Bravia 9 as they did with their 8K. So the 8K was a rush, a, a gold rush that never panned out. 4,000 nits is cheap and easy. And I think that will pan out. 8K is not cheap and easy, right? You saw the whole stack that required 8K bandwidth and data rates and compression and processing and storage. 4,000 nits doesn't require any more storage. 4,000 nits is relatively easy to grade once you have that grading monitor uh, so the cost to go to 4000 nits and it's cheap for tv makers to have it for hisense to give you a 4000 nit tv much cheaper than for them to give you an 8k tv trust me on that the processing and the motion and and tone mapping and just all the stuff required for 8k more of a nightmare than 4000 nits so i think we're going to get there with 4000 nits first and everyone else is following suit because it's easier to upgrade your buying desires to 4,000 nits. Can you imagine at Best Buy what it looks like? Oh my gosh, it's 4,000 nits versus, oh my gosh, it's 8K. And you're like, I don't know. And a 65-inch TV looks the same to me, which it does, right? But 4,000 nits, 4,000 content. Demo content, 
at Best Buy. A 4,000 nit TV and a 1,000 nit TV, yeah. You're gonna see that difference. They're gonna sell a whole lot of TVs and that's why I think it's coming. And that's why I think Bravia 9 will stay relevant simply because of that. All right, now there's one out the front door. I think I have to go. Um, all right, and I think this is a great way to end, guys. <laughs> go bring in your Bravia 9 before the porch pirates get to it, right? <laughs> Hey, thank you so much for joining me. And I think I caught all your super chats. Thank you very much, everyone. Hope you guys enjoy this stream. Let me know if you have any questions about the Sony. You can post it here. We will get the Bravia 9. I don't think, I mean, I'm, I cannot get the Bravia 7. I might, Sony might get it to me. But are you guys interested in the Bravia 7? Let me know in the comments below. And until next time, my friends, stop the FOMO.